with your palate cleansers. Show me what you got. Welcome in everybody to a brand new episode of Audio Knots, your pop culture palate cleanser. I am Eric Old Boy online with the infamous R E N. What is up, Mr. Ren? What is up? Man, I feel so bad because we like recorded an episode like last week. And the audio was so trash that we we uh, kind of just disregarded it. So I apologize yeah. to the audio nets out there. We we had uh we had severe technical difficulties. Uh normally uh, Ren is the one that records it, and he was having some issues, so I tried, and my internet was just so much garbage that it sounded garbly gook, and so I actually went out and bought new internet. I have fancy, yeah. dancy new internet now. So I think we're good, right? Oh, we're so good. We're so good. We're going to have on an amazing guest today, um, probably our biggest guest yet. Uh, we're having the one, the only, Mr. Rick Emerson. Uh, some of you may know Rick Emerson as a radio personality that was on the radio on his own show uh, ad, you know, titled Rick Emerson Show, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, from 1997 to 2012, in one form or another, he's been kicking it on the radio. He retired to become an author, a novelist, if you will, writing all sorts of amazing books like Zombie Economics. And we're going to talk to him today about his brand new book, Unmask Alice, LSD, Satanic Panic, and the Imposter Behind the World's Most Notorious Diaries. Um, I'm super excited to have him on and hear what he has to say. Satanic Panic. It sounds so bad right now. I like this day and age. The Satanic Panic? Yeah. Well, like, you know, it, if you say it nowadays, like, what is that? Who's the cult? It's kind of like Stranger Things where like, you're like, we got to cancel them, you know? I think even back then, you know, when they talked about that kind of stuff, that was the whole point, right? So uh, the book covers Go Ask Alice, which was this kind of unwritten diary about uh, supposedly a teen that wrote about them getting into drugs and sex and all this different things. And it was like her diary and it was like an unknown author. And uh, Rick kind of dives into who really wrote it. What was it really about? What was it trying to accomplish? That kinds of things. And then the other books that this person supposedly wrote, all these like dead teen diaries, you know, about Dungeons and Dragons is going to get you, you know, drugs are going to get you, Satan's going to get you. And so he kind of covered all those aspects in this book and reveals really what's going on so it's i mean talk about a a fun read i mean i think everybody should go out and uh, get this book it's pretty cool yeah i think the the timing is so right for him to you know like all these podcasts for like true crimes yeah everybody loves those type of shows and then this is like another media that people are getting consumed it's like a good timing for that book to come out for him and release it yeah, it's kind of funny how things are cyclical that way, you know. Uh, it was crazy back then. That's even crazier now. And he really dove into it. I mean, he was straight up investigator reporter, like going yeah. through it and learning all the details. And it's it's pretty exciting. You're right. I think that uh, there couldn't have been a better time for this, you know. Let's start off with the healthy stream. Let's start off with Disney Plus. We're going to cover all the new things that they released just uh, last week. They had their uh, big old Comic Con and they released all this new information about new movies and TV shows and things like that. So we'll sort all that out and uh, we'll talk about the things that they've just came out. You know, we, we've been off the air because our messed up episode for quite a while. Uh, we never gave our final review of Miss Marvel as a whole, uh, Thor, Love and Thunder. Um, I think that we should talk about those couple things first. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, like, you know, Marvel wasn't holding back with all the information. Man, they're just, like, giving you left and right, dude. Like, let's go phase five. What about this phase six? And it sucks because we've been gone so long, been so busy with life that we didn't get a chance to, like, touch on any of that stuff. The end of phase four? (laughs) Yeah. Phase four was kind of garbage, though, right? I mean, it was the most mediocre set of movies and TV shows that they've produced yet, in my opinion. Yeah, I feel like, you know, phase four was a, a result of uh, them shooting movies in the pandemic. And it's just like so mid like that. Well, I talked about it a little bit before and on our Twitter account, if you guys are following us on Twitter at Audio Nuts. But um, 
they they brought in this thing called the volume when they shoot all their movies on these giant LCD screens now. And it really kind of like makes them feel small and the 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 visual effects look kind of bad. And so I think that maybe I don't know, there's something not working quite yet with the way they're filming their film their movies now. Yeah, and it, you could like it's like obvious you could see it. And it's just like uh maybe because yeah. we're like creatives, then we could see it. Maybe. And but I feel like I feel like the movies haven't done as well either. And so and people complain a lot about the TV show. So I think that, yeah, we maybe get caught up on it more than most people. But I think everybody at least can feel that something's off, whether they're noticing it's because the visual effects have gone back 10 years in technology or, you know, the other things. The fact that it feels like they're filming everything inside of a giant room. Right. But let's talk about uh, the stuff that just came out. What do you think of the end of Miss Marvel? Now, you've seen the whole series. What was your what was your final review of the series as a whole? The series as a whole, I I because because I have really really low expectations for this show. Yeah, I actually end up liking the show a lot. Just really, because, all the way through, all the way through, just because uh, it was well produced. All the graphics were really cool. It was well acted for her for being her first thing she's done right. And yeah. then it, it it gave us a really cool representation of uh, their culture. And what they're going through, and you know, so, so it's it cool to have that, you know, representation on the on the on the screen. And at the end, it gave us a little, little um, you know, teaser for what's to come. Yeah, I do give uh, Marvel all the credit for t- tying everything together pretty well. And so, yeah, they they were teasing already the Marvels movie at the very end of the series, which was cool. It was really cool, and I I also agree that this. This show kind of was better than I expected it to be. Um, I thought it had uh, pretty decent visuals compared to a lot of stuff. Uh, the acting, here, like you said, was good. And it had a, like a uniqueness to it that we hadn't seen before. Um, right. Kind of like a fun. It was. I was worried that it was going to feel like a Nickelodeon, Nick at Night type of show. And it was a little bit better than that. So I, I liked it okay. Um, I'd give it a six. What would you give it? Mine's more like a seven just because I, I, I appreciate all the graphic elements in there i just uh, there was a couple episodes that felt like filler and for how short the seasons are on these shows that was kind of a bummer that they couldn't have had a more cohesively you know run season that gave you something good every single time and i thought the villains the villains were a little weak so you know it was what it was yeah it's funny because there's the one episode where uh it was a flashback or yeah not really a flashback but you know back in time yep and then my wife comes to the room she's like why are you watching a Bollywood movie? That's right. It looked kind of like, like a Bollywood yeah. movie. Why won't am I not watching a Bollywood movie? You're like, everybody's watching the Bollywoods now. Yeah. It's, it's the thing. Um, so yeah, you gave it a seven. I gave it a six. Uh, it was, you know, another okay turn in the kind of Marvel TV universe. Uh, it was better than, you know, honestly, it was better than Moon Knight. <laughs> I, I would have to agree with that. I enjoyed it more than Moon Knight because Moon Knight, maybe because our expectations were so high in Moon Knight. We're yeah. like, oh, shit. That might be the biggest part of it is both of us expected Moon Knight to be huge and amazing and it was yeah. okay. And neither one of us thought Ms. Marvel was going to be any good and it was it was better than okay. So I think that kind of came down to it. Yeah. What did you think about uh, Thor Love and Thunder? So that's been out for a hot minute. Everybody's had a chance to go see it. You know, I just read today that it passed Ragnarok for domestic uh, ticket sales. Really? I thought there was people were like, hating on it. Oh, people are definitely hating on it. Yeah. <laughs> but it just goes to show you that the internet doesn't always know. Yeah, because for me, I'm a huge Taika fan. And so I loved it, man. It was it's a fun, like, through and through it was almost like a parody of itself in a way and it, it was just a fun movie and it was enjoyable the only thing that i didn't like about it was it it was focused on thor too much and i kind of wanted more of um mighty um, thor no no uh, not mighty thor but the bad guy the bad oh, guy was gore gore i wanted him to like you know if he's like the god butcher i wanted to see more scenes of him just butchering gods left and right and give you that menace feel you know yeah i think they kind of missed it right there where they could have really dove into making him feel more scary than he ended up being because uh yeah they didn't take much to take him out in the movie 
And uh, I don't know. For me, the movie was super me- mediocre. I I liked it better than Thor one and two because I hate those movies <laughs> with a passion. <laughs> but uh, Ragnarok by far is still my favorite Thor yeah. movie. Yeah, I think Ragnarok was the perfect mix of Taika and Marvel. Yes, and this one this one was like ninety percent Taika. Yeah, it was almost too t- too much Taika, and I really like Taika, but maybe not when he's in the Marvel universe. I'd like to get it to. S- they still feel like it belongs. This feels like a one-off. Like it doesn't belong in anything. Like so, if you want to watch it and just enjoy a silly kind of Marvel-y superhero movie, you know, it's, it's whatever. But it doesn't yeah. feel like it has any stakes in the MCU as a whole. Yeah, that's why I I liked it because it was like a date night, you know, enjoyable movie. It's, it's funny from beginning to end. Yeah, um, uh, Kid Danger. Liked it so much that he went and saw it twice. Yeah, it's that good. <laughs> so, what what would you give it on a scale of one to ten nuts? How many nuts does Thor: Love and Thunder get? Thor: Love and Thunder is a solid seven. Oh, okay. I'd give it <laughs> a four. It's below mediocre for me. I'd probably not be interested in seeing it again right away. Um, there were some bits that really got me, and I laughed, and nobody else in my theater laughed. <laughs> but uh, other than that, it was kind of, I don't know, take it or leave it. It's like, you know, the only thing I didn't really like about it, like I said, uh, gore. They they have, he had his stupid, um, what the hell is his sword call? Like, it's like one um, of the, one of the, like Marvel's crazy ass weapons that are, um, that, that's in the movie, and they, they didn't really expand on that. Yeah. <clears throat> the movie was almost too short. You know, they didn't they didn't want to take any time. They kind of got to run and right right away. It the, it just flies by. The pacing was super quick. Uh, it just to me, it had some issues. Um, the special effects were kind of bad for a movie of that size, like the part where the kids like are like like Become floating or, like yeah. ghosts or whatever is oh, happening. Yeah. That was bad. But then but, it's, it's kind of like Marvel CG has been so bad lately because, you know, when uh, uh, Idris Elba's kid with the face thing was kind of weird looking, you know? Yeah. Even like in Dr. Strange, when he got his third eye, it was like, Oh my God, this effect looks so lame. You know, it's like low budget. Well, I've heard that they're overworking the graphic artists, like the visual effects effects guys are uh, just overworked and they're not having enough time to keep up with all the, the labor that they have to do. Yeah. It was just too much coming out probably. Cause you know, it used to be just movies. Now it's both movies and TV. Yeah. And speaking of movies and TV, they released the whole slate of like all this stuff coming out. And so the next thing we are going to get is She-Hulk, which we already kind of knew about. But what's exciting is we learned that it's definitely going to have Daredevil. And we've seen uh, some of Daredevil in his yellow suit. What do you think about that? Does that make you more excited or less excited for She-Hulk? Yeah, because they they brought you back some like comic book outfits. So I'm like, that's cool. I really want to see it like full on though because it's kind of like just like glimpses in like the darker area like, yeah give me like bright yellow well they're they're going all out for daredevil so he gets to have a um a cameo or two inside of she hulk and he's gonna be in the tv show echo and he's getting his own series with 18 whopping episodes which I'm, I'm super excited about it's like let's play catch up with daredevil yeah and i heard today that they're bringing back uh, Punisher with the original actor John Barenthal from you know Walking Dead, and yeah, so uh, and it's going to be M A, so it's going to be mature audiences only. So that's good. I'm glad Disney hasn't shied away from doing that kind of R rated adult versions of stuff that existed before it ended up on Disney. Yeah, they they're kind of slowly getting there, right? With Moon Knight, and then this one, uh, She Hulk. You could kind of see there's more like you know sexual situations in there. Like, right. What are they going to do? You know? And so I think they're kind of like leading their way towards Deadpool. Oh yeah. I mean, at a certain, I, I tweeted, tweeted on uh, um, the Twitters that watching Deadpool on Disney plus is kind of like high in your playboy inside of like highlights magazine. It just feels wrong, <laughs> but that's good. I'm glad that they're, they're getting there. You know, in other countries they have, it's called the star and it's like the Disney, a grown up version of the Disney stuff. And they kind of separate it out. Uh, over here, it's kind of up to parents to set their parental, you know, guidelines so yeah. kids can just watch whatever. Yeah, because like you know, they have kids version. Even like my my uh, anime app, there's an option for me to click to see to see a uh, mature content. 
yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> yes, and thank you. Yeah. Um, so they released a bunch of other things. So I'm reading them off all the things that are coming out. Yeah. Um, and this doesn't cover all the things that they've covered before because they have talked about other items, but these are what they specifically talked about at uh, the San Diego Comic Con. So after I list them off, I want you to tell me which three of them, if you could only see three of them, which three you want to see. So you got the I Am Groot, you got Spider Man Freshman Year, you got What If Season Two. X Men ninety seven, Secret Invasion, Guardians of the Galaxy three, Echo, Loki season two, Blade, Ironheart, Agatha the Coven of Chaos, uh, Captain America New World Order, which is a cool title. I saw New World Order trending, and I thought that the the white supremacists had finally taken over. <laughs> oh, I I thought of um because I'm a big uh, wrestling fan. Yeah. NWO baby. <laughs> is that a wrestling group? Yeah, remember it's like the black and white. I don't outfits. remember. I, I didn't watch a lot of wrestling. <laughs> and then Hulk Hogan was in there. Everybody was <laughs> big sexy Kevin Nash, you know. Every, everybody was in there. Uh, um Daredevil, uh what's that say? Born Again, uh Thunderbolts, the Fantastic Four, Avengers, the Kang Dynasty, Avengers Secret Wars. And the multiverse multiverse saga. So, if you could only choose three of these things between the, all these TV shows and movies, which three are you most excited for? Option A, all the above. Let's go. Oh, we can't um, do that. I, I'm a genie, and I, if you gotta make your wishes, so which three are gonna exist? Man, it's 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 you have to like separate it into like which three movies versus which three shows, right? Because okay. like for me, I really want to see Secret Wars. Okay. Um, and then I, I'm very biased on 97 X Men because that's the X Men I grew up with. Oh, nice. But I'm I'm only hoping that um they don't PC it down because back in the day, they, you know, <laughs> they're gonna nerf Rogue for sure. Oh, for sure, for sure. And then the last one is Daredevil because I love me some um, uh, what's his name again? Cox. Oh, um, what is his name? Matthew Murdoch. His name is Charlie Cox. Charlie Cox. I love yes. him as their devil. So I want to see him. Yeah, he's the perfect cast. Yeah. So then, you those know, are the like, three TV shows. How about the movies? Oh, wait, movies? Yeah, because you on. totally you totally cheated and you just named your three. <laughs> I listed both TV shows and movies, so you just named the three TV shows you were interested in, which was X Men '97, Secret Invasion, and Daredevil. No, now I'm gonna Secret, give you a chance. Secret Wars was number one. Oh, well, Secret Wars. That's a movie. Okay. Yeah. We'll just leave it at that because, well, I, it's like the multiverse, the big movies, it's like they're yeah. must-sees, right? So you can't right. really like, oh, I'll skip that. Those are must-sees. So it's, well, it's I'm, the, like, I'm the genie. So those are the three. You don't get to see Fantastic Four now. You don't get to see the Kang Dynasty. Because like the Kang is going to set up Secret and the Secret yep. is going to set up, you know, the, the multiverse saga and it's just. I think I'm most excited for if I was looking at this list, I'd probably go all movies because this, the TV shows have been some have been surprisingly OK, but that's kind of like the top of the line. You know, I feel like if you're ranking them and it's all equal footing, the TV shows are never better than a six or a seven. You know, maybe once in a while you'll see an eight, maybe. But the movies could be tens. Right. So Infinity War is one of my all time favorite you know, movies, Marvel or any other movie. And so I would go. I would go Guardians 3 and then the two Avengers movies, Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars. Those would be the top three for me. Did you I'm hear... ner- nervous about Fantastic Four. Oh, yeah. Did you hear the theory about the um, Secret Wars, how it's going to go? No, let's hear it. This this one fan theory was awesome. I, I saw it on like TikTok or something. Yeah. Where they're saying that all the Kang are going to come fight each other because it's the Kang Dynasty. Oh. That we already saw in Loki. So they yep. can come back and try to fight each other. All of a sudden, oh, to beat the Kangs, we need to beat. We need to get the heroes here. So we can, they're gonna get all the heroes from all the multiverses to come fight the Kangs. And then once so, they defeat the Kangs, oh shit, they had to go back. And then they're gonna have like a a civil war in in the same planet to get rid of the heroes, and that's Secret Wars. So it sounds it sounds pretty complicated, but I'm down. I'm down for it. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um. 
Yeah, I'm not sure how they're going to do it. I hope that they have a plan because, and I'm sure they do. Phase four felt like filler. Phase four, they might as well just call it the pandemic phase, you know, like almost like they wanted to do more, but they couldn't. So they kind of like, you know, it was the filler episode of all the phases. Yeah. Phase Let's four. All this crap. <laughs> yeah, phase four is kind of like 2020, right? What happened? <laughs> yeah. Who who knows what happened? I don't know. It's a blur. Um, over on the Netflix, uh, there's been a lot of things going on. Like I said, it's been a long time since we talked. So what was your uh, feeling and rating for season four of Stranger Things? Oh, yeah. We never talked about that. Huh? We didn't. Well, I think we did in the episode that died. <laughs> Yeah, because it feels like we did, but we, we yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I I actually really like this season. Uh, it would be season one, season four, and then the other two. This is my second favorite season out of the the whole series. I hundred percent agree. Season one to me is still fantastic. Season one of Stranger Things is a perfect ten. I literally own it. I think I showed it in the episode that died that I own it on DVD, like a real jackass who has. Uh, Netflix, I still own Stranger Things. Um, but yeah, season four, like it took me a hot second to kind of let myself go to the silliness that Stranger Things has kind of become. But it was just Nightmare on Stranger Things Street. That's all season four was. And it yeah. was fantastic. And the last episode was one of the most epic bits of TV that I've ever seen in a long time. And it was well earned. I mean, it was it was silly, but it was great. And I loved every bit of it. Not ashamed. And then that's why they they like cut it into like you know where it, they cut it where they cut it and like we're gonna give you some time because we can't just give you it to you all at once because we know how good it is. Yeah, and they were giving us like two hour episodes, and quite honestly, that episode, that two hour episode of Stranger Things, was one of the best things I've seen the entirety of the year besides Top Gun. <laughs> it wasn't long enough, man. I'm just like, keep going. Dude, I, I would go back and just watch that scene, the last battle scene. It was the most epic, fan-filled thing ever made, and I loved every moment of it. Yeah, I agree. I would give Stranger Things Season 4 a solid 9. I enjoyed it. It wasn't quite as perfect as Season 1, but for that one episode alone, it made it pretty fantastic. Yeah, I would agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. Okay. Umbrella Academy. Have you seen it all the way through? It's been done now? Yes. Okay. So what did you think? What season are we even on? Is it two or three? I can't remember. <laughs> three. Three? Three. All right. Why not? <laughs> Umbrella Academy season three. Uh, what would you give it? What did you feel about it? Were you happy with the direction that it went? You know, they're once again, yeah, season three, because they're once again saving the earth from, you know, an apocalyptic ending. Um, what did you think? And for me, it's kind of like Stranger Things where, you you know, I liked it better than season two. So season one, because it, it gives you Umbrella and then season three, season two. I like the fact that they kind of stuck with the family and just kind of like it was more like family issue. Sure. And it was kind of cute. It was it was pretty good. I mean, I didn't like it as I think season one is still my favorite. And but I did like, it, I think, better than season two. I yeah. like the introduction of the Sparrow Academy. I like that we got to meet uh, kind of an angry Ben. Yeah, uh, I liked. Uh, I forget what the new girl's name was that became a major part of it. Do you remember Simone or something like that? I don't yeah, remember the, the Gravity Girl. I yeah, the girl that could make people float. I thought she was kind of interesting. There were bits of it I didn't like as much. Uh, there were parts I was really impressed with. I thought they did an excellent job of handling uh, Elliot Page and her uh, his transition i thought i was it was well done it wasn't forced yeah, yeah i um, agree 100 percent. i liked how all the characters reacted to his uh trying to ask to make sure you guys i prefer to be called victor all that stuff i think that was that was well done and well handled yeah. and so i i enjoyed it um not as much as stranger things four but if you're into umbrella academy it was it was a good season it was a solid seven and a half yeah, I think five needs to like win some kind of Emmy, man. That kid could act, dude. You <sighs> forget when you're watching him that he really is young because he acts so much older, and you believe it the whole time in your mind. Yeah, he's he's fifty. <laughs> <laughs> I think when he first started, he was like fourteen, and it's kind of like he's been fourteen the whole time, you know. Yeah, and that kid came straight from Nickelodeon. He was like on some dorky show with like, yeah. like where he was like one of a triplets or something. I don't remember some really dumb yeah. Nickelodeon show. So good on him, great yeah. actor. And I love Klaus. 
and what they did with Klaus this season was pretty cool too. And like they get finally gave him some like the limelight and like, oh hey, that's pretty cool. And they really upped our our ability as the audience to understand how dope his powers are. And before it was kind of like, oh, his powers are kind of lame. I see ghosts. Yeah, he I sees see ghosts. Dead people. Yeah. yeah, but it's cool. What he can actually do turned out to be super duper cool. Yeah. That was like the, the most surprising part of the show for me. Really? I'm like, oh shit, this Klaus's powers. That's yeah, cool. his powers ended up being almost as good as uh, Victor's. You know, they yeah. tend to, uh, he's so OP. And then you're like, oh, well, hold up. Maybe they're all kind of OP and we just don't know it yet. Yeah. Um. Also on the Netflix, I watched a couple of movies. Uh, I, I, I flew to Hawaii during our breaks and I watched uh, a lot of Netflix movies on the way there and a lot of Netflix movies on the way back. So one of the movies I watched was The Gray Man with Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans. And <clears throat> have you seen that movie yet? Oh, it's on my list. I keep forgetting to watch it. OK, I'm here to tell you, you should watch it. It's fantastic. I don't know if it was just because I was a captive audience. But damn it, I loved this movie. It was exactly the kind of movie I thought it would be. It was super fun. It was full of action. I thought uh, Ryan Gosling did good. I thought Chris Evans was amazing as the bad guy. I had never really seen him uh, play that kind of douche guy before, and he did it so well. I love it. It's like if The Bourne Identity was a lot cooler. That's all this movie was. Wait, you never watched a, another team movie? He was kind of douchey there. Oh, I've never seen that movie. Really? That was no. his debut. That's his <laughs> never, first movie. I'll have to go back and watch it. I've never seen it. My my wife loves that movie. And when she dropped the knowledge on me, like, yeah, that was Chris Evans' debut movie. No, it's not. I'm pretty sure she's done stuff before that. Sure yeah. enough, dude. This first she, movie. She was right. Oh, well, there right. you go. Well, so Chris Evans can do no wrong. He can play good guys. He can play bad guys. He can be Captain America. He could be this douchey guy in this thing. But I tell you what, Ryan Gosling just walks around, you know, like your typical nonchalant guy that could kill everybody and is never quite like worked up or worried about it. And there's a lot of funny bits. Uh, there's a lot of good acting. Um, the action looks good. The, the special effects actually look pretty good for a Netflix movie. Um, I would rank it pretty high. I'd give it a solid eight. I enjoy this movie. You just want a dumb popcorn movie with that's about two hours, just ass kicking explosions. You can't go wrong with the gray man. Is it like a Netflix John Wick? Yeah, absolutely. It's a 100% Netflix John Wick with a nice. little bit better dialogue. I think Nice, better acting. Well, I mean, it's not hard. John Wick. There's not a lot of dialogue it's just him running around killing people with pencils but it's it's in the same vein for sure plus they have this kind of element where they give you a little kid he has to protect which makes it you know a little more heartfelt so that was cute too nice um the other movie i watched and i'm not ashamed to say it as a grown adult man i watched a child's movie called the sea beast now, the Sea Beast, uh, the main actor, the main voice actor is uh, Carl Urban. You may know him as the Butcher from The Boys, which is kind of what attracted me to it. Oi! Oi! That was that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I'm like, oh, I'll watch this. You know, why not? I'm stuck on a plane. And I'll tell you what, it was really good. I don't know if it was because I was expecting nothing. I had never heard of this movie be beforehand. I had never seen a single trailer for it. I had no idea what I was getting into when I played it. And it's essentially how, how to train a dragon, but with sea monsters. The animation is fantastic. I couldn't believe how good it looked. It was just beautiful. It looked like something that should be in the theater. And the story was great. Uh, if you have kids at home, you cannot go wrong with the Sea Beast. And even if you're a grown adult like me and just bored, it's a it's a good two hours. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Nice. Well, I guess you were been watching a lot of stuff because you were stuck on the airplane for like what, four six hours. hours there, six hours there. <laughs> yeah. Six hours back. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, I'd give it a, a seven. So anybody wants to watch a, a fun kids movie by themselves or with their kids, you can't go wrong. Um, and then last but not least, I just started. I don't know if you've started watching it yet. But I've watched the first episode of the uh, Sandman. This is a, a DC Vertigo comic series that they finally converted into its own television show. So Neil only, Gaiman. Ooh, Neil man. Gaiman, yes. I'm only one episode in. Have you seen any of it? Um, I've been waiting for my wife to watch it because she's yeah. a big, big Neil Gaiman fan. Oh. She hasn't been in the right mentality to watch it so she's like preparing herself to to, to like take it well if she in. if she's a big neil gaiman fan she is going to like it it is pretty darn good so that you have to give the effects a little bit of a break the effects aren't amazing they're they're kind of mid 
but uh, the story so far is really good. And I have to be honest, I've never read a lot of the Sandman comics. Um, I've known about them for a long time. I probably even own a couple. But uh, it's been kind of interesting for me to learn the lore and the story. But uh, I'm enjoying it quite thoroughly so far. You said one episode? Only one episode is all I've watched so far. So I hate to even give it a, a rating because it could go right. probably any way at this point. But uh, we can touch base on it and talk about it more maybe next episode. We, we've been burned in the past with like the great first episode. And it's like, yeah. it's downhill from another. Yeah. <laughs> and then just trash after that. Yeah, yeah that has happened. Yeah. That has happened. Was there anything you were watching on Netflix you want to talk about? No, it's all you mentioned already. So over on Hulu, um, you watched a movie that I really want to see but haven't seen yet. It's been getting a lot of rave reviews on the interweebs. Oh, uh, yeah. What did you think of the movie Prey, the newest Predator movie? Prey? I, I went in with low expectations okay. because I'm like, how the hell is a, a Native American lady going to fight a goddamn predator with all those <laughs> gadgets, you know? Well, yeah. You're going to throw axe, knives, and rocks at it or some shit? Right. But the, <laughs> the execution of it was actually really good. And the story was cool. And um, I'm a huge Predator fan because I grew up watching all the Predator movies when I was young. And so this one was by far like the third best one. For the me. third best one behind which were the first two best ones. Well, first it's the first two because I'm very biased towards okay. it. Okay, because that is kind of like you know it's nostalgic. If I go yeah. back now and watch, but like, this movie's trash. <laughs> <laughs> they don't hold up so good. Yeah, but this one's really good. The, uh, the fight scenes are really cool. You get a lot of cool like badass predator um, fights and stuff like that. And you... they they push a lot of like you know, uh, woman empowering that was pretty cool. Okay, and um. Yeah, overall, I, I liked it because I went in low expectations. I'm like, you know what? I actually like this movie. It's pretty good. Do you need to have seen any of the previous Predator movies or remember having watched the first one back when you were like 10? No, because this is kind of like Predator's first hunt, you know? Like an origin type story? Yeah, the, well, the thing is, like, you can't really call it a prequel because this is like another Predator movie where he, here's a Predator, goes to Earth, fights humans for, for you know, because they're hunting. Right. So there's no lore behind like the predator like history, so you don't need to know anything. Let me ask you this: in the predator movies, is it always the same predator, or there's just a bunch of predators out there, and the, a predator dies every movie? It's there's like a whole um like a whole planet of predators, and it's kind of like oh, it's this guy's turn. And so the predator, the predator planet, is just like a planet of like dickheads that go around killing people. Yeah. They're like, you know, the, the, the apex of the, you know. Yeah, yeah, I get hunters. an apex predator. <laughs> yeah. And so they just go out like, hey, I'm I'm the best hunter. I'm going to go test out my skills. Okay. Oh, there's okay. humans. You know, so it's kind of like, it's pretty basic, but it's pretty cool. Okay. So uh, on a scale one to 10, what do you give it? Uh, I gave it a solid eight. I enjoyed okay, it a that, lot. That sounds like a recommendation. I'm going to have to watch Prey. So Prey is available on Hulu now. Um, o- only other thing I want to talk about on Hulu is there's a show that I'm kind of kind of excited about. I, I saw the trailer for it, and I think I sent you the name of it, but it's called This Fool, and it looks kind of funny to me. Have you seen the trailer for This Fool? Yeah, it's like, well, what was the catchphrase? Like, hugs, not thugs. <laughs> yeah, hugs, not thugs. So This Fool, is, it looks like it's about like a – um, uh, South American, uh, Latino American guy that's like trying to get out of the gang life. And he's trying to like, there's like a group or something where they're trying to teach him all to be good guys. And he's trying to be a good guy. And everybody's just kind of thinking of him. He's like the new dweeb now because of how he's acting. And it, the whole thing just looks like it has such a, like a dark humor to it that I think I might enjoy it. It's funny because they say that he's 31. I'm like, this guy's not 31. He looks so old. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably part of the jokes. You know, it, it reminds me a little bit of some of the stuff Taika's done. I don't know if this Taika has anything to do with this or not, but it looks like it's in that same kind of comedy vein where it, it doesn't like it's not too slapsticky, but it has this really dry humor where you're kind of laughing at this guy as he attempts to like better himself and nobody wants to have any part of it. All right. So I'm down. Uh, this Fool debuts on August 12th. Moving over to Amazon Prime. Uh, there was actually a new show on Amazon Prime that I was super excited about um, called Paper Girls. Paper Girls is based off a comic book. Uh, I read it as a graphic novel format, and I was pretty pumped for it. 
Um, I noticed that the, the internet really seemed to like it, but in the end, I found it kind of disappointing. Um, I felt like they really raced past the kind of setup in the introduction of characters, and then they slowed it way down in the middle, which was okay. And then they had kind of a really lame, like, sci-fi channel finish with, like, some of the worst special effects I've ever seen since Sharknado. So really? I was kind of bummed by that. Coming from Amazon, too? Yeah, usually Amazon, I mean, look what they're doing with the boys. So whatever it was, they did not give the paper girls any money. <laughs> it's the boys took it all. I guess. Have you seen any of the paper girl show? I have not. So essentially, you, you'd you probably hate it because it has to do with time travel. I know you're not a huge Ooh, fan of time yeah. travel. Hate so time travel. the basic concept is there's these four 14-year-old girls in 1980-something, and they're all on their paper route on November 1st. So it's like 4 a.m. on November 1st. So Halloween has just ended, and there's still some dickheads running around doing stuff. But November 1st of this year also happens to be the end of the world. And so as they're kind of racing around, these two weird guys kind of attack them and they skip past all this part. And it's really detailed in the comic, but they think they're the bad guys, but they're not really the bad guys. And as they're running around trying to save themselves, they go to get the, like a parent's gun. And one of the girls actually shoots one of the other girls. And then these two guys help them and use their like they're like from the future. And they help like fix this girl who's been shot. And then the girls end up getting zapped until 2019 when they start running into themselves. And the whole series takes its time as they get to ask their adult versions of themselves for help to try to get back to their 1980 something lives and turn things back to normal. But of course, as it goes, things just keep continually get worse for them and things get wrong and more messed up. And so it's kind of an exploration of, you know, young teens and like those sorts of things while at the same time being very sci-fi ish. Yeah. And what worked in the comics feels really hokey on screen, like the the sci-fi overlords, the the time, whatever they call them, patrol. <laughs> the old watch, I believe, is the dumb name that they have, uh, like flies on like pterodactyls and the pterodactyls look awful. And it's it's really strange. So it Wait, works. Were there pterodactyls in the show? Yes. Yeah. At oh, the very shit. end. Yeah. So the pterodactyls work super duper well in the comic, right? It's interesting and funny and different, uh, but it does not work at all in the show. Jumping over to HBO Max. Um, I'm pretty excited about what's coming up on HBO Max, which is The House of Dragon, which oh, yeah. premieres on August 21st. The House of Dragon, of course, is the prequel to Game of Thrones. Um have you seen the trailer? What do you think? Are you excited for it? Or are you like, did Game of Thrones burn you too bad with the last season? I mean, I got burned too bad, but then I'm I'm excited to see more dragons. <laughs> well, hopefully it's the same quality because I think that I read somewhere, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, that this is also based on a book, but a book that's complete. Oh, then maybe it'll be good. Yeah, because I thought I read that. Oh, this will be better because the book for this particular show is completely done with the start, beginning, and finish versus Game of Thrones itself. Right. Okay. Well, I have higher hopes for it then. Yeah, I do too. Um, it's going to be weird getting back into the Game of Thrones world, but with completely different characters. Yeah. So that'll be interesting to see. Because every basically every Sunday when we watch it, we op- we crack open a bottle of wine and drink while we're watching it. You drink a whole bottle of wine every Game of Thrones? Yeah, dude. <laughs> You're going to like it no matter what, then. By the time it's over, you'll be so drunk, you'll be like, oh, that was really good. I mean, it's, you know, share amongst the people that come over, but, you know. Yeah, that's wild. But the big news on HBO uh, is you saw that uh, Warner Brothers is having all sorts of issues. They've been canceling movies. They canceled yeah. uh, Batgirl, like, after it was completely done and in the in the can, ready to go. Yeah, it's it's crazy how like once they you know announce that they're just like let's just cancel everything. Like, whoa, what what's going on here? Are they trying to sell it to somebody or what? So my understanding is Discovery purchased um, Warner Brothers. So you know Warner Brothers has been owned. Warner Brothers HBO Max has been owned by a few people. It was owned by AT and T. It was owned by somebody else, and now it's owned by Discovery. And so Discovery has a brand new head of whatever CEO of entertainment or something. And he's like, you know, screw this noise. I want to make money. I'm less concerned about good content. I want to make money. 
And so he started killing stuff that's not going to make money if it's just garbage. And so he's ripping it all out and getting rid of it. And I guess they're going to get rid of HBO Max itself, but not necessarily the content, more of the title. So it's going to be called like Discovery Plus, maybe Discovery Max. I don't know. Something new in twenty the summer of 2023. So like the, the, the name HBO has been gone, but all its content's going to be there. Well, I think HBO itself will still exist on like cable and satellite, but I think HBO, the name HBO Max, which was a self-contained streaming uh, service, I think that's going to be gone. But I think all that content is shifting over to something with the name Discovery in it. And they said they wanted to focus more on different reality stuff, which is kind of a bummer. I, you know, I wanted like less Property Brothers and more, you know, you know, DC com, you know, content. So. So you're saying I got to watch all my DC stuff before it's all gone. Yeah, I think that uh, you probably because, you know, one of the first things they did real silently is they went through and they kind of yanked all the uh, Warner Brothers original movies. So all the uh, like are the HBO Max original movies, things that they had made specifically for the streamer that weren't anywhere else, like American Pickle and some of these other. If you try to go find those now, they just don't exist. And so uh, they're they're slowly going in there and cutting the, the the fat off. You know, they're getting rid of stuff that they don't think they need anymore. A lot of people are really upset that they killed uh, Batgirl, and yet the Flash is still coming out, and Ezra Miller is running around like a psycho, like yeah. doing stuff. Even today, I yeah. saw this fucking guy. guy got like decided to rob someone of their alcohol out of their house or something. He's been charged with felony burglary. Because I've told this story once before, where my we went to the the Portland Comic Con. Yeah. And we they were promoting um Justice League and we walked by and there was like, you know, Cyborg, Jason Momoa, Ezra Miller, they're all there. Yeah. And we walked by Ezra Miller's booth and then my sister there's a nobody in line, right? Yeah. And my sister looked over and he looked straight at my sister and smiled. And she got so happy, she started crying. She's like, Oh, look, the flash smiled at me. And the other day I brought it up to her, Aren't you glad you didn't go? <laughs> You can't go get his autograph. She, I know he's such a crazy person now. Yeah, he would have nabbed her, took yeah. taken off with her. He'd be like, "Oh no, I made a huge mistake." Yeah, at that time she was so happy, but now she's like, "Good thing I didn't do it." It makes you really wonder if they're gonna have to suck it up and kill that movie because they like they killed the Batgirl movie, but they they keep saying, "Yeah, Flash is coming out, Flash is coming out," and this guy is like going out of his way to get this movie killed. It's like he's just done being a celebrity. I think he's just gone cuckoo completely. Yeah. It's, it's it's wild. It's so wild. Need affordable graphic design? Visualantidesign.com should be your first stop. High quality work at low, low prices. Perfect for every need from corporate to personal. Visit Visualantidesign.com now and request your free quote. And for a limited time, mention Audio Knots for 10% off your first project. Um, that is all I had for the healthy stream. So I figure we'll jump into some tasty trailers. And then after that, we're going to get to Rick Emerson. Ooh. I'm so excited. So uh, I think it's time to listen to some tasty trailers. All right. So my first one, um, <laughs> I didn't know this was even coming out until I saw the trailer. And then I was like laughing. I'm like, what is this? And it looks pretty amazing. Uh, the new Dungeons and Dragons movie starring Chris Pine, of all people, Captain Kirk himself. Uh, what else is Chris Pine famous for? Is it just Captain Kirk? <laughs> uh, uh, Spider Man, uh, Chris Pine. He does a lot of things. I just don't realize that he's in it. Yeah, he's been in a lot. Wasn't he in Varsity Blues? Wasn't that him? Or was that Chris Evans again? <laughs> Varsity Blues? You know, the guy that had like the whipped cream on his junk? No, it was Chris Evans. It was Chris Evans. Are you yeah. sure? God, yeah. I don't know. Like, there's too many guys named Chris. Like every, it's like a, it's a known fact. If you're in Hollywood and good looking, oh wow, he was in. He was in the last uh, Wonder Woman. Movie. Wonder, Wonder Woman, Wonder yeah, Woman. Yeah. yeah. Or he I was think, in both Wonder Woman. Yeah, I was watching that trailer. Like, man, it looks kind of cool. But then Chris Pine just kind of threw me out of the game. Like they should have, they should have cast someone else. Like somebody that, like, that's more nerdy. You know, like, this guy's just too cool for school. Well, maybe they wanted that like hero type, right? They wanted the the hero of the thing, but he's kind of a dipshit, you know. So like things aren't going quite right. Right. And I like the fact that it's clearly a comedy. 
Um, I don't know. It was giving me kind of uh, original Guardians of the Galaxy vibes. Like if you took the Guardians of the Galaxy silliness with uh, another Chris yeah, and you switched it over to like dragons and stuff, that would be the new Dungeons and Dragons movies. I'm curious if uh, OG Dungeons and Dragons D&D fans will be excited or offended that they're kind of making fun of their genre. I feel like they might be offended. I don't know. <laughs> Well, everybody's so easily offended these days. So who knows? You know, did you ever see the old school D and D movie um, with like Marlon Wayans and stuff? Marlon Wayans? Is it Marlon Wayans? <laughs> Wait, you're telling me there's a Dungeons and Dragons movie out right now with Marlon Wayans in it? I feel like you remember uh, Boy Meets World. Did you watch okay. that? Yeah, I remember uh, Boy Meets World. Uh, his brother, his name was Eric in that show. Yep, I remember. He was that. in that movie. That's where Marlon Wayne's in there, but I must be make, I might be making shit up, but I remember <laughs> watching that movie and liking it when I was a kid. So I was a kid, as, but as soon as we're done with that cast, I'm gonna find out what the Marlon Wayans guy from Boy Meets World Dungeons and Dragon movie yeah. was. Because that sounds amazing. Well, that's cool. So would you go see the new Dungeons and Dragons movie, or is that gonna be a wait for it to show up on a free streamer one day? Uh free streaming. It is a theater movie, though, in case anybody's wondering. Only in theaters. And it comes out March 23rd. I like how uh, they advertise theater movie. Like, only in theaters. Well, it's like a big deal now, right? You know, because yeah. so many movies come out on streaming and some are both at the same time. So whenever they decide this movie, I think it's almost like them saying, we think this movie is good enough that you'll pay extra for it. <laughs> yeah. This is a $60 trip to the movies type of movie. Um. The next trailer I have is for the new Pinocchio movie. The new Pinocchio movie is not only in theaters. It is actually coming to Disney+. Plus, um, and it stars Mr. Tom Hanks. And this is a competing Disney movie, because, or Pinocchio movie, because I believe uh, Benicio, or whatever his name is, Del Toro, or Del Toro. whatever his name is, is making yeah. one too. Yeah. Um, what did you think about the Pin- Pinocchio movie with Tom Hanks? Yeah, because I, um, I looked it up, and yeah. I watched Tom Hanks one when it first came out. Yeah, and then, and then um, I like which one is he talking about? So I watched it both, and the one the one on Netflix honestly looks better to me than the one yeah. on Disney Plus with Tom Hanks. Because I think so because the Tom Hanks didn't really show anything. Well, they, they have a bigger trailer right now. Know? They released a new one at uh, Comic Con, and it shows more. Like I think that uh, some of it looks a little bit better. Looks kind of cool. But what's really bothering me is Tom Hanks doing like this old man Geppetto voice. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, hello, our little Pinocchio. And he's just like, it takes me out of it. It feels so fake, like it's a Saturday Night Lights skit. Are you looking for your Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> I, movie? I so am. distracted. You don't even I was care about totally it. wrong about the Boy Beast World guy, though, by the way. Oh, what was but the Marlon Wayans is in there. He is in it. And what's it called? Is it just called Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah, it's called Dungeons and Dragons. What the hell? What year did that come out? 2000. So 22 years ago, a Dungeons and Dragons oh, movie came out with a, probably an extremely young Marlon Wayans. Interesting. Yeah. Is it on any of the services? Can I go watch it as soon as we're done? Oh, I have no idea. But I, I'm mistaken the the Eric character I was talking about. Yeah. Um, he was in the old school Lois and Clark oh. TV series with the Tory Tory Hatcher Superman. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the Avengers really of Lois that. and Clark. He was the Jimmy. Jimmy Olsen? Show. Yeah. So. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. So, Pinocchio, are you going to watch it? Um, <laughs> probably. It's because it's a Disney show. I'll probably watch it. I'll probably watch it, but I feel like I'm going to hate it. But I hate all the live-action remakes. There hasn't been a good one yet. Yeah. Tom Hanks just looks kind of weird in that show. <laughs> yeah, it looks super fake. It's so weird. Um, My next trailer is Shazam! Fury Shazam. of the Gods. Um, This one I'm actually pretty pumped about i really enjoyed the og shazam i'm excited that they're bringing in so many uh new characters are like they're kind of uh focusing on the brothers and sisters a lot more yeah. and then you get like these two old ladies as the bad guy which i think is kind of fun so i'm I'm eager for this one i know yeah lucy lou doesn't age dude yeah she's still a hot i'd still <laughs> go out with her let's go yeah I, this is probably a theater movie i'll probably see this one yeah, this one is a opening weekend theater movie for me. I'll be yeah. there. I'll spend the sixty bucks to get my popcorn and bladder buster drink and go watch it for sure. I just, I just find it funny watching this trailer that they show you clips of Batman, Flash, and 
Superman. And say the, the old actors, like, are they still the Aquaman? Are they still part of this universe? Are they what are they trying to do now? You know, like well, I've heard that they're completely rebooting DC, so maybe this is like the last of it. Like this is kind of like the art of last artifacts of what was the Snyder verse or DC verse or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Cause it, it seems like they're kind of resetting maybe because they've from the very beginning and have had kind of a multiverse thing going on that they can just play it off. Like brand new universe. Look at it. Yeah. They, they need our reset, get these movies out and just, you know, and then we'll lock them in. That's it. Yeah. I agreed. Yeah. Cause honestly, none of them have been amazing. Uh, honest Shazam and the first wonder woman were my favorites. And then some of the weird side stuff they did, I thought was better. Like I, I like Joker a little bit. I like the new Batman a little bit. Yeah. And so, but they weren't really connected to any of this. Doom Patrol. Oh I, man, I love Doom Patrol. I hope, like, if I hope HBO Max doesn't cancel that. I love me some Doom Patrol. In fact, if you like Umbrella Academy, go watch Doom Patrol. It's ten times as good. Ten times. Um, the trailer for Andor. They gave us a bigger trailer for that, so we had seen a few teasers here and there. Uh, so they gave us a bunch more of that. And for whatever reason, after I've been sitting here complaining about Disney and their shitty special effects, somehow Andor looks really good. <laughs> like, it looks like an old school Star Wars movie with real effects. It doesn't look like they're in front of the giant screen. It feels big and wide open. And I don't know. I'm kind of I'm kind of excited about this movie now. Maybe they shot it before they got the new tech. <laughs> Maybe. It looks way better. Um, something about Andor just feels like the old school Star Warsy stuff versus what they've been doing. So yeah, I'm pumped for it. How about you? I think it's the it's the the fact that it's more adult rated, like oh more grown up, you know? Yeah. Cause like a, a lot of the new ones is more catered to like trying to get the young the young fans who like Star Wars. But this one's kind of like, you know, this is a suicide mission. <laughs> Sort of well, thing. that's the only downside is we yeah. know that everybody in this show is already dead. <laughs> yeah. And I think I was telling one of my, my buddies, like, I'm kind of, uh, Star Wars is kind of like getting kind of lame now because they're, they're trying to fit everything in this universe that we already saw the beginning and the end. Like they're yeah. trying to fit in, all, in between all the cracks now. I just get something new. That's why for me, Mandalorian was the best show because it's it was fresh. something different. Brand new yeah. character. Yeah. I completely agree. Uh, Andor, though, if you're interested in it, which I am, comes yeah. out at the end of the month, August 31st. Yeah, I'll still watch it. Oh, I'll still watch it, too. Then we got at uh, Comic-Con again, we got the new Black Panther trailer. And they give you a glimpse of the Panther at the very end. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely is it that it's Shuri? Um, Malcolm B. Jordan, baby. That's you think call. so? Yeah. So the colors look right. So it looks like a black and gold. But the inter internet is telling me that uh, it's too feminine of a body to be Michael B. Jordan, which would be my choice, too. I'd love it if they like Killmonger came back and from a different universe and he's the Black Panther. That would be so dope. But I'd almost bet money that it's Shuri. I'd say on a scale of one to ten, nine and a half, it's Shuri. Yeah, it's probably Shuri. Or my second guess is going to be um, his wife, uh, the Lupita chick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from uh, Us. Yeah, and then my third would be killmonger yeah no i hope it's killmonger and that's not because i don't want a, a woman to be black panther it just killmonger is so dope so that'd be that'd be really cool but uh we'll see you know my wife my wife's favorite mcu movie is black panther so guaranteed i will be there on day one yeah and then she does namor in this one which is kind of cool he looks really good yeah and then in this trailer you see uh uh Ricky Williams, Ironheart. Just did you catch oh, that? Oh, Riri, Riri Williams. Riri. Yeah. What did I yeah. say? Ricky. Riri. You yeah. said Ricky. I was thinking Ricky Williams was the running back for the Miami <laughs> Dolphins. Oh yeah, that's right. I'm like, he's in the trailer. Yeah, he owns like a lot of weed shops now, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a buyhead. <laughs> Riri Williams. Yeah. No. <laughs> She's in the trailer if you if you if you watch it. Yeah. Yeah, I. I uh... I didn't see her originally when I watched it the first time, but then the internet was pointing out that she's there. And that's kind of exciting too, because I am uh, eager for the Ironheart show. I'm not like super pumped for it, but I like the connectivity. And once again, we mentioned that earlier, the fact that they're still keeping everybody kind of connected. And like, so we see her there first, I guess. Like who, who, uh, who's smart that we still have left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, it'll be interesting to see how they incorporate her into the, into the show. 
I'm guessing like, you know, she's going to need help with her armor and then Sherry's there. Like, hey, let me help you. Oh. I'm smart, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's good. Uh, Black Panther comes out on November 11th. So this is a holiday movie. Um, something you can watch during your Thanksgiving break. Can you can you imagine like Riri Williams wins some kind of like trip to Wakanda because she did like really cool prototyping. And then all of a sudden she goes to Wakanda for her school trip and like fucking all hell breaks loose. What's happening? Dude, I, why is there a war? That's so good. I wouldn't doubt if that's the real plot. <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty good. You should write these movies. That, that was yeah. spot on. I bet you that's something close to what happens. I mean, why is she there? Yeah, why uh, would she be there? She won a trip. Like, you won a trip to Disneyland. Yep. Let's she go it's to true. Wakanda. It's true. But when I went to Disneyland as a six-year-old, nobody, like, uh, handed me any special powers. So, uh, unfortunate. Um, also coming out, and not in theaters, but straight direct. This is kind of interesting. This movie is coming out direct to the Roku channel. So, the only Ro- way you can... Still exists? Ro- Roku. Yeah. Well, yeah, I use Roku's. And back in the background behind me, there's a TV playing a Roku. So Roku has its own television channel that plays mostly like <laughs> like 1990s like reality shows like Jerry Springer and Sally Jesse Raphael. Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> but they are uh, they have a movie coming out that I'm actually super interested in. I don't know if you would be or not, but having grown up a weird Al Yankovic fan and listening to all his hilarious, you know, parody songs that were often better than the original songs they were making fun of. Um, I'm so interested in this because Al, Big Weird Al himself is like an executive producer. So he's actually been part of this. And it's called The Weird, Weird, The Al Yankovic Story. And it stars Daniel Radcliffe yeah. as Weird Al. It's so, it's such a funny casting, man. So random. Like, I felt like he looks too small. And I don't know yeah. if Weird Al is small or not, but he looks like a, a mini version of Weird Al. Yeah, we're out with his freaking longs, curly hair. He just looks tall. Yeah, and he always felt taller than than Daniel looks, anyways. But um, I will definitely watch this. I do have Roku, so I can. I'm sure I must have the Roku channel because I don't think it costs anything. But uh, I am down to see uh, Daniel Radcliffe try to be Weird Al. Yeah, it's gonna be weird. It's gonna be weird. That movie comes out on exclusively on the Roku channel on September eighth. You could report back to us. Yeah, I'll tell you about it because I don't know if you have Roku's. No. No, so you'll never get to see it. <laughs> um, My last my last uh, tasty trailer comes from our dear friend Sylvester Stallone. So Stallone hasn't done anything super good in a long time. By the way, I went back during a bored period of time and I, I watched for the first time all of the um, those dumb expendable movies. You watch them all? All of them. All three. I think there's only three. It was great. Yeah. I've never seen them before. They're all trash, but I I did enjoy for what they were. Just a bunch of old ass 1980s action stars running around, you know, never dying. You see the scene I was telling you about when he's running with the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I saw all of it. The whole thing was funny. Like it was always it was cracking me up when like, you know, Chuck Norris would show up for no reason, just blow yeah. the hell out of people and then leave. <laughs> like, why is he here? I don't the funniest thing is like I'm like, why the hell is Terry Crews in here? He was never an action hero. Just because he was big and bald. buff, I guess, and they <laughs> needed him. You know, that was, you know, I don't know if you've ever followed the Terry Crews story in real life, but he's one of the fail few male super actors that came out with a whole Me Too movement saying that someone felt him up, you know, did one of those things, like propositioned him for his job. And Man. you know when that happened? On the set of the expendables. Really? Yeah, so that's why he'll never go back. The Expendables Bulls 3 was his last one. He's not going back because the producer of those movies was the one that supposedly like kind of like seduced him or tried to. Damn, he got Brandon Frazier. Ah, yeah. That sucks. So um, but anyways, Sylvester Stallone has a new movie out. It looks, I don't know, it looks kind of decent. Maybe it's not, maybe it is. I have no idea. Quite With honestly. your favorite kid actor. <laughs> With my number one up and coming young actor. Uh, Javon Walton, and you'll know Javon Walton from anything that's awesome. I mean, this kid was in Euphoria, Umbrella Academy, Utopia. I mean, the list goes on and on. This kid, whoever his manager is, is doing a fantastic job casting him. So I have a feeling that maybe this will be better than it needs to be. But essentially, the new movie is called Samaritan, and it comes out this month as well on August 26th. And I feel like it was a streamer, but I didn't write it down. What Do you remember what streamer said it was? 
was it like Amazon Prime? I don't remember. I should wrote it down. It was either Amazon or Netflix. So uh, Samaritan comes out on one of those streamers that you probably have. And it has an old ass Sylvester Stallone. The main plot seems to be that he's kind of stopped being a superhero. Like he's like one of these tough superhero kind of bros. And he's not into it anymore. He's like a garbage man or something now. And Javon like tries to get him back into it to like fight away the bad guys. And so it's kind of him regaining his superhero-ness. Right. As an old man. As an old, old superhero, which I'm down with. In fact, the one thing I noticed during the three Expendable movies is how awful uh, Sylvester Stallone's plastic surgery would get each movie. I mean, his face looked like it was melting off like an old candle. It was yeah. awful. And so I'm pretty pumped that he's clearly stopped a little bit and grew the beard. I think the beard hides all the weird plasticiness a little bit, so he doesn't look like such a psychopath. Yeah, he looks better in this movie. Yeah, he looks better now than he has in the last 10 years because he's starting to look like a melted, I don't know. But um, yeah, I'm interested. I'll watch this movie. If it's a free on a streamer, I'll watch Sylvester Stallone and, and Javon Walton because that kid's awesome. Yeah, I'm. He's gonna be. He's gonna star in the in the reset of DC. He'll be somebody in that in that reset. Well, you have pushed for a long time that he should be what one of the Robin characters, right? Drake or something. Well, I wanted him to be Damon Wayne's, but he's he's probably by that time be too big to be Damon Wayne's. Yeah, but he'll probably be a Robin. Yeah, because he's got to be what sixteen now, something like yeah. that. Kid's been in everything. He's always he always plays a badass. He just must have that demeanor because that's what they cast him as every time. Or maybe just give him, make him Jason Todd. That way he could be Red Hood later. There you go. Yeah, because he's a bad, a bit like a badass, big old badass. You know, Jason Todd, um, the Red Hood is one of Tyler or uh, Kid Danger's favorite uh, bad guys. He loves him. He we have a few action figures of him. Well, he's he's more like a anti anti hero. Yeah, and then he in one of the comics though, like kill Batman or kill the Joker or kill somebody he shouldn't kill. <laughs> Yeah, he killed Joker because he's like, you know, like because Bruce never kills. He's like, right, yeah. F you, Bruce. Here's my gun. There you go. Problem, problem solved. That's awesome. Oh, well, that wraps it. That wraps it for the tasty trailers. I think it's time to get to our interview. So we're gonna get uh, Rick Emerson on the horn here and have an interview with him, and it's gonna be fantastic. So I, I'm sure yeah. this is, everybody's probably fast forwarded at this point just to get to the Rick Emerson part. So I get it. Uh, everybody, uh, buckle up. This is gonna be a good time. Here's I'm Rick gonna, Emerson. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go change first, and then, <laughs> yeah. and then we'll, go, we'll we'll talk to him because it's a yeah, dress nice. You know, I feel like maybe two people watch this on YouTube, so I wasn't even gonna tell them that, that it was pre-recorded. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, everybody. Enjoy the Rick Emerson interview. All right, Audio Nuts. I'm super excited. We have a a, a huge. Huge guest on with us today, uh, author Rick Emerson, uh, a brand new novel coming out. Uh, it just came out recently, huh, Rick? Uh, yeah, actually. Wait a minute. Look, it's on the wall behind me. There we ah, go. yes. Unmask and- Alice, LSD, Satanic Panic, and the Imposter Behind the World's Most Notorious Diaries. So that's exciting. And this is the part where my publisher would, would want me to jump in and, and to clarify that it's a nonfiction book. Um, uh, that it's, uh, you know, in, in fact, given some of the subject matter, it's kind of, that's a crucial distinction I want to make right out of the gate that it's, uh, it is a true story. It reads like a novel and it's as crazy as a lot of novels, if not crazier, but yeah, it's an absolutely true story. Well, it's kind of exciting. I mean, you, you mentioned that it's a nonfiction book written about a supposedly other nonfiction book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the backstory of the book, uh, go, go ask Alice. Yeah, so Go Ask Alice uh, is a book that came out in 1971, and it's the supposed posthumous diary of a teenage addict. It's supposedly the diary of this girl who gets lured into drug use, runs away from home, um, you know, gets clean, relapses, gets clean, relapses, and then finally she dies at 17, and she leaves behind, uh, allegedly, this diary, which is then edited and published uh, as a book called Go Ask Alice, A Real Diary by Anonymous. It came out in 71 and it was a huge, huge deal. Still still is in many ways. It came out, sold something like 5 million copies, and wow. it really helped to create the modern young adult uh, genre. And it also helped to solidify a lot of ideas about uh, drugs and the war on drugs, especially among, among older people. And then... Um, and then seven years later, uh, another book 
uh, sort of a sibling book, I, I sometimes call it, called Jay's Journal came out. Mm-hmm. And Jay's Journal was kind of a twist on the same idea. Jay's Journal was the supposed posthumous diary of a teenager, this time a boy, who had been lured into witchcraft and black magic and eventually committed suicide. And Jay's Journal was supposedly, again, his posthumous diary that had been released. And just as Go Ask Alice helped to really fuel and you know, the war on drugs, Jay's Journal helped to launch or and certainly helped to accelerate what we now call the satanic panic, which was this 15-year literal witch hunt that went through the 80s and 90s and just destroyed lives left and right. Um, what most people don't know, what I certainly didn't know, uh, you know, before I started this book, before is that both of these books, Go Ask Alice and Jay's Journal, both marketed it as absolutely authentic diaries. They both came from the same strange place, which is this giant house with blood red walls on the outskirts of Provo, Utah. So it's wow. just uh, it's a it's just a mind blowing story. Well, what's interesting uh, from what I've heard is um, Beatrice Sparks was the one that kind of came out as the editor. But uh, was she part of the like the Mormon faith? And I was just curious of like how much of it was based off of a real person versus fiction that she's created to sell books. And that's a good question. That is and especially with Go Ask Alice. That's the question that everybody's had for 50 years, because um, and just as a side note, before I get to that, I'll say that one of the amazing things about Go Ask Alice is that so that book came out uh, 51 years ago and. It is not only, you know, it's not only still in print, it's never been out of print. Uh, Simon & Schuster put out a 50th anniversary edition last year. And if you go on TikTok, which I don't because I'm ancient, (laughs) but if you go on TikTok, you know, one of the amazing things is you can see that there are, you know, young people today, there are teenagers, people who are 14, 15, 16, who are reading Go Ask Alice uh, for the first time, not because a parent or a teacher told them to, but because they read about it online, they heard about it from a friend. So Go Ask Alice continues to really have a huge impact in in publishing. And the thing that people have wondered about and argued about since the very beginning is, well, is this book real or is it just anti-drug propaganda? And when Go Ask Alice first came out, uh, you know, certainly in the first decade or so, probably 90% of the coverage treated it as absolutely authentic. And to some degree, that's because it's, you know, there is no editor listed. There's no adult presence. It just says, uh, let's see, in fact, I've got got a copy right here. You know, it just says, go ask Alice a real diary by anonymous. And there's no other credit. And also people didn't really want to seem like they were stomping on the writing of this dead teenage girl. Right. So, so it was really treated as authentic. And then by 2000, 2005, that it started to shift to where it was maybe 50, 50, 60, 40 with people thinking, well, maybe this is just, you know, nonsense. Maybe this is just a bunch of anti-drug, you know, propaganda that's been put together just as like a scare tactic. And that's, that is kind of what I thought. Um, going into this, I was, I, I had sort of decided it was just nonsense. What I, and I don't mean to be too coy about this, but it's, you know, it's like when you go to see a movie and somebody will say, uh, you know, what, you're better off if you just don't look up anything about the movie, just don't right. Google it before you go. Yeah, so, yeah. um, so I will, what I will say is that there is an answer to this question of was there an Alice, is Alice real? There is an answer to that. And by the end of, of my book, I do lay out the broad strokes of what happened. And it's neither of those views, the idea that it's totally fabricated or totally true. The truth is somewhere in between. And it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty fascinating story. Uh, to your question about, about Beatrice Sparks, yeah. she... Um, uh, eventually kind of outed herself as the the alleged editor of Go Ask Alice. She, when was uh, that? What year did in, that happen? Uh, it, the first real major mention of it uh, was in 1977, and that was when she gave an interview to her hometown paper in Provo, because as okay. you noted, she was a Latter-day Saint and, um, you know, very conservative. She was, you know, president of the, of the local Republican women's group. And, you know, and she and her husband were very active in Provo society, which for all intents and purposes, especially then meant Latter-day Saint society because it's, that's right. Is now, and even especially then was a very, very heavily religious, very Mormon community. And um, so in 77, she gave an interview to the Provo Daily Herald and she said, well, and she told, what kind of became her canonical backstory about Go Ask Alice. Now, the story shifted a little bit every time she told it. She seemed, 
incapable of telling the story exactly the same way twice, which Keeping sort of cat, raised back straight. Yeah, it was like if you looked at her accounts of it side by side, you'd say, well, this doesn't seem like what you said last time. And so that you know, before the Internet, it was, I think, a little bit easier to get away with that. But eventually people started to sort of line those things up and say, well, this doesn't seem right. But the 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 sort of canonical story that she settled on at its core was that as she told it, the the core story was that she had met this this girl that we all ended up calling Alice, that she'd met her at a Christian youth camp, and Alice had had some trouble. She'd had a drug problem, and that the two of them had a connection. They really bonded, and that they stayed in touch later on. They corresponded, and that then, tragically, when Alice died a short while later, she left behind these diaries, and Beatrice Spark said, oh, you know, I'm going to take these diaries and in Alice's honor, in her memory, I'm going to edit them and publish them, uh, to, you know, to sort of help parents or young people who are dealing with these same issues. And it's, you know, it, maybe it can help somebody else. And that was kind of the story that she gave. Um, and so in in 77, when she kind of outed herself and told the story, um, a woman who lived just a few miles away from her, a woman named uh, Marcella Barrett, whose son Alden had... Uh, had committed suicide a few years earlier. He, uh, he'd struggled with depression and with substance abuse and had really turned his life around in, in a lot of ways, but, but still ended up, you know, he ended up committing suicide and he had had left behind a journal. And, and so uh, his mother is reading the paper and she sees this article where Beatrice Parks sort of says, Oh, I am, I am the, I am the person who edited this, you know, girl Alice's diaries for publication to help other people. And um, and Marcella Barrett is reading this article and she thinks she thinks, oh, this this is the reason, you know, this is this is the greater good that can come right. from my yeah, son's yeah. death. This mm-hmm. is, you know, this is the the very small but important silver lining. And um, and that, you know, and and so then a few years later, we get the book called Jay's Journal, which, as Marcella Barrett found out the hard way, was uh, was an inaccurate representation of her of her son's life. It was uh, distorted, to put it mildly. So <clears throat> Beatrice had figured out way earlier than the rest of us how to manipulate things for profit and uh, gaining popularity and all these kind of things. That's something that we, in this day and age, you see every single day in media and all these different things. And she had, she keyed in on that early. And I'm wondering, like, was she you consider her like a pathological liar because I heard that she claimed to go to school here and there was no real proof of it and those types of things. Uh, one of the things that I discovered is that it's uh, um, somebody once said, um, I forget where I, where I heard this from. Somebody said, uh, they said, never, they said, they said, be wary of ascribing to evil what can sometimes be explained by simple incompetence. And so here's what I mean by that in this context, yeah. which is that one of the things that I uh, did not know going into this whole process is that, I mean, I assumed like a lot of people that there were, um, you know, that there were checks and balances in place in the publishing industry and that there was a lot of fact checking that went on. In other words, you know, when, uh, you know, whether it's Go Ask Alice or whether it's that book, A Million Little Pieces by James Fry, you know, some mm-hmm. 15 years ago, I assumed like a lot of people that if something says true story or nonfiction, that there's somebody somewhere that has inspected it and signed off on it. They've been, you know, they've actually checked it and they've gone like, good enough. And they yep. approve it. And that, and that the, you know, and that the occasions when, when something does come out and then it turns out that it's been, you know, debunked or it's a fraud, that those are the exceptions. In other words, that those are the things that somehow managed to slip through. What I didn't really realize is that in a, you know, in the United States where, I mean, if you go buy a sleeping bag or a can of soup it's got to have ingredients on it. It's got to list what's inside. It's like That's this right. sleeping bag is 45% cotton and 35% rayon and, you know, whatever. And the soup has got to say, you know, if you buy a can of tomato soup, it's got to tell you everything that's in it. Sometimes there are bad actors and there's deception. But for the most part, anything you buy in this country has got to be labeled. Books, not so much. They're in, you know, in the publishing industry, it's essentially an honor system. And the thing mm. about honor systems <laughs> is honor systems only work on people who don't need them. I mean, right. if you're going to people. follow an honor system, you didn't need the honor system to begin with. And, you know, in publishing, um, and when I say, when I talk about the difference between evil and incompetence, it, that's actually a little too glib. It's really not necessarily either of those things in publishing so much as it is the fact that, you know, there's 
profit margins are always kind of thin and they've gotten thinner over the years. And you know, a lot of times large corporations, especially just don't really feel the need to pay a fact checker. And so this is a long way of saying that um, in publishing, you know, there's essentially just this trust that you, the author will tell the truth right. and that you're not, and we trust you not to lie. And by the way, you're almost always your own fact checker. And, you know, and so if you, you know, just discover either intentionally or accidentally that, hey, I like wrote this thing that turned it, you know, that was totally wrong or that was made up and nobody noticed or nobody cared. And especially if that ends up being successful or making money, you know, it's not too hard to imagine people going like, well, that's way, you know, it's way easier to just make something up than to go research something. Right. And I think it's just a, it's a case in, you know, as in many of these things, it's just a case of escalation, you know, where if you discover like a, if you discover a loophole or a flaw in the system, a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people will do the right thing and not take advantage of that loophole, but there's going to be some people who are just like, Hey, to hell with it. I'm just going to do it. Yeah, speaking of like research, I know that you, uh, you put a lot of work into the research of this book. Um, your previous book, Zombie Economics, I heard you say on another podcast, it only took you 18 months or something. And you thought, this is easy. Yeah. Yeah. I, that was like a little hubris on my, but it was the universe <laughs> teaching me a lesson, I think, because I, yeah. So when I, I wrote this book uh, a decade ago, co-wrote it with uh, Lisa Desjardins and, um, mm -hmm. and, and some input from our friend Todd Workoven. And it was, I mean, that went from like idea to sold to published in like two years, something like that, less than two years. I was like, this is, who are these fools that take seven years to write a book? Well, the answer apparently is me because when I went to do this I, in 2015, which is, I think at the end of the book, I can't, I think I say something at the end in the author's note about, you know, I started this book and, you know, six years later, it's finished. It was actually closer to seven, but it was just yeah. too depressing to write. So I just, you know, I was just like, I didn't even bother rounding it, but um it, it took, I mean, I can blame a little bit of that on COVID, but um, sure. it just ended up being, part of it was uh, just that this story was so big, so much bigger than I expected. I mean, that's one of the things, you know, about this story is that um, every time I thought that this story could not get crazier, could not get weirder, I just yeah. was proven wrong. I mean, if you had told me at the beginning that this one story with just these two young adult books goes from Hollywood to um, the behavioral science lab uh, at Quantico to literally into the Oval Office, uh, you know, uh, and then it all passes through this little section of Utah that's called the fraud capital of America. And that it's linked to, you know, like the, in, in a tangential way, at least to a lot of things like the West Memphis three, you know, who were, these, wow. you know, young men who were convicted during the satanic panic. And all of this is bound together. I mean, I just had no idea when I started this kind of how big and, and crazy this story is. That's exciting. I mean, so did you actually, were you traveling to locations, interviewing people? I mean, you basically became like an investigative journalist at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another reason why it took me so long is because I, it just, it was a kind of learning as I went. And um, fortunately I started this during, you know, before COVID, which, which is lucky because, you know, obviously as we all, even as that sort of in a way recedes, you know, in the rear view mirror, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you can, you can kind of feel, you can kind of tell how things get misremembered 10 or 20 or 30 years later. Cause even now, it's like my brain, it's like sometimes it's a little hard to remember just exactly how shut down everything was. Absolutely. Right. For, and it didn't seem like it was ever going to end. And anyway, but I had started this before that, fortunately, because, you know, when I first, I mean, at first when I had this idea, I was, I mean, I assumed that somebody else had already done this. I thought, right. Go Ask Alice has sold 5 million copies and it's, you know, it was, a, it was a movie and it's, it's big, you know, has this big cultural footprint and there's been all this discussion about it. Surely somebody has written this book. What I, the conclusion I came to was that everybody kind of thought somebody else had already written it. Everybody thought the story had been told and nobody really had. And so I came home and, um, you know, I just started like the way you always do these days. I just started Googling and, uh, and it turned out that for all intents and purposes, like a four page article from 1979 was really 
the most in-depth thing that had been written about oh, Goes wow. I mean, you know, a few things notwithstanding. And most of the other stuff was just recycled from that. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll look a little further. I looked a little further. And there just wasn't a lot out there. And um, and so finally I just had to go, you know, kind of full analog where I I was then just calling. It's a first of all, I should say it's amazing how many people still have landlines because I would <laughs> dig up these old phone numbers. And, you know, you think a landline, you're like, there's no way this can still work. Yeah. And a lot of them were disconnected. Some of them weren't. It was, you know, especially if somebody, I think every year over 65 that somebody is, like the likelihood that their landline still goes works way goes up. up like exponentially. Um, and then it was, you know, sending letters that sometimes came back undeliverable or unopened. And then, and then eventually, yeah, as you said, I was sort of traveling and literally knocking on doors and ending up you know, in the basement of some county assessor's office somewhere, just going through like dusty records that nobody looked at in however long it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a fascinating process, but I am glad, I'm glad I did not know going into this kind of how long and in depth it was going to be. It was, um, I, I can't really, comp I'm certainly not complaining about it, but it was, it was, um, sorry, my dogs apparently think I'm ordering a pizza. <laughs> Or I assume if it's an actual home invasion, I'll find out momentarily. Sure, yeah. That, I mean, that'll make for a really hey, good Why podcast. don't we not do that? <laughs> <laughs> no worries. That's the beauty of it. Oh, uh, well, well, I guess we'll, we'll figure out what's been left on my porch later. Uh, in any event. Amazon. All right. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, and it, but yeah, so it was, it was a long, long road. And uh, I'm kind of glad I didn't know going into it exactly how, how momentous all of that research was going to end up being. That's that's I mean, as a writer uh, or as an author, um, have you always been more attracted to the nonfiction side of things? Have you ever attempted to sit down and write a piece of fiction or anything like that? Because I know you come. I don't know if all of our listeners know, but you you're, in my opinion, one of the great radio hosts of my time. And uh, I'm ex so excited just to talk to you on that part. But uh, how did you kind of uh, move from being a radio host into I'm, I'm going to be a full time writer? Uh, uh, to answer your question, sort of out of order, I did at one point and one point only, I, I made like one stab at writing a novel, which went really, really badly. That's really? like a lot of writers. It's like, I have a, I have a book in a drawer somewhere that like nobody's, I should just burn it. Sure. Nobody's ever going to see it. It was just dreadful. <laughs> um, I sent it to my agent, my agent, like very politely went like, mm, no, <laughs> just like, it's like, don't, like, don't continue this. It's not worth it. Um, but I mean, but as when I was younger, I read fiction, but as I got older, I really gravitated um, to nonfiction, you know, once I got old enough that I was kind of choosing my own books, I've always been much more attracted to nonfiction, which, and writing fiction is obviously that takes real skill and there, I'm certainly not anti-fiction, but just mm -hmm. my own personality is such that, you know, there's just so many unbelievable stories that happen out in the world in real life that are just, are just endlessly fascinating to me. And especially because, and this is a thing that has kind of always been the case with me where I've always been interested in what I call the, the sort of the hidden history of, of everyday things, by which I mean, you know, growing up, um, you know, I, I remember like my mom and I would go shopping and, you know, we would see picture frames for sale or something. And I would think, well, like, who are these people in the picture frame? You oh, know, yeah. who, do they, do they know they're in the picture frame? Like where <laughs> do these, you know, or when you yeah. go, like I was at the, I was at some store the other day and it was like, it was like, they were selling discount Halloween costumes or whatever. And so on the front, there's like, you know, there's something like the B girl from the blind melon video costume or something. <laughs> and on the front, there's like a woman posing in the B girl costume. And I was like, well, who is this woman? I mean, it's like, and there's really no reason why I should find that so interesting. I just do. And yeah. you know, who are the people laughing on laugh tracks and all of that. And, and so the, the sort of thing behind the thing is, you know, that's always been really intriguing to me. And when I first read Go Ask Alice in high school, um, you know, and I picked it up off the shelf and it just said Real Diary by Anonymous. And I was like, oh, and I read it. And yeah. I remember asking my friend um, about it after I read it. I was like, it's like, hey, so what's the story with this Go Ask Alice by Anonymous? And she's like, well, nobody, you know, it's just an anonymous diary. And I said, I said, yeah, but like, who is it really? And she looked at me like I was kind of a not very bright child. Yeah. And she said, well, nobody knows. That's why she's called anonymous. Duh. And I was like, all right. But that, but it always kind of stayed with me, this idea of like, well, how can nobody know? How can nobody know? Like, right. it, you know, as, as Lester Freeman on the wire would say in this country, 
somebody's name is on a piece of paper somewhere for everything. Anytime business is done, somebody somewhere knows the story. And, um, you know, so anyway, that, yeah, that's a very, very, I always over answer questions. Well, that's good though. It makes me Um, wonder. (laughs) So if you, you read the book as a teen and then what re sparked the interest as an adult that you said, you know what, uh, this is wild. I need to be the one that you say, because you assume someone else had uh, already written about it. What, what happened? Did you just decide to reread the book? And you, this time when you read it, you're like, oh, this is garbage. I can't believe that I bought into this. Or all of us bought into this at one point. Um, what was that point like? Uh, first of all, you get a lot, of, got a lot of credit for getting me back on track there because I tend <laughs> to just go off into the weeds. Um, oh, I love it. A good Rick Emerson think- tangent. <laughs> I think on some level, my brain sometimes feels like it's a little bit like a toaster where you put in a pop tart and you press the thing. And then like later it just ding. And you're like, Oh, that's right. I put that in. And I think my brain sometimes is working on things, uh, you know, without me really knowing it because I, I had, um, you know, I grew up during not just the war on drugs era, but during the, the Nancy Reagan, just say no era. And so that was a huge part of that. But by the time I left high school, you know, the satanic panic was really in full swing. And that was a thing I lived through. And I remember, you know, not just at church, but at school and at home, hearing all these stories about, you know, if you listen to Ozzy Osbourne records, yep. you know, they can't play Dungeons some, and Dragons. somewhere in some other town. Yeah. That'll like, yeah, he'll end up, you know, you'll end up killing yourself because Black Sabbath will tell you to do it or whatever. And there was all these scare stories going around. And, and so that was obviously kind of percolating. And um, I, I had actually, I feel like I almost don't get any credit for this idea because I, I had just been, I've been having breakfast with uh, my friend, Peter Ames Carlin, who's also a very talented writer. And he's, mm-hmm. he's like, what are you working on? And I was like, well, you know, and I, I kind of bluffed this answer because I wasn't really doing much of anything. And I just sort of like said something to kind of make the question go away. And, and then on the drive home, I mean, this sounds like a made up story. This is like, uh, I think I compare it to, it's like when you hear Paul McCartney talk about how he dreamed the song yesterday and you're like, oh. well, that, come on, how is that? But I was just driving home from breakfast and literally I was just driving home toward my house and I was just heading toward a stoplight. I mean, this sounds made up, but it's, I swear to you, this is true. There was just this sort of out of the blue, just this flash in my mind. And I thought, and it just popped into my head almost fully formed. Now I didn't know how big the story was going to be, yeah. but it just kind of popped into my head. It said, Hey, you should, you know, look into the story behind, you know, go ask Alice and the actual true story of this person who was probably behind it. And that's when I came home and I got online and I several hours later realized that nobody had really done it. So it, um, you know, it's a combination of just, of just time and, and luck and, you know, circumstance, I think. That's we, amazing. Do we call that the pop tart moment? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, the- yes. <laughs> yeah. It was, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, it's like when you're trying to like, think of somebody's name or, you know, what was the guy in that television show? And then yeah. at like 4 a.m. you wake up and you're like, Ted, his name was Ted. That's it. <laughs> and that was kind of how this was. Yeah. The pop tart moment. That's exactly yeah. what I'm going to call it. That's great. So have you read any of the reviews? I was online. I was looking at it and I'll tell you what, it's blown up on Twitter. People are excited. People are loving it. I ordered my copy. I think this is pretty great that you've almost re built interest in this book from 1971 and people want to know more because I think before, like you said, people took it wholesale as truth. And now it's more almost go ask Alice is more like grief for madness where we're like, it's a curiosity. And it's like, Oh, they're, they were clearly trying to push propaganda and we want to see how it's exposed. So I'm excited to see uh, how this turns out. And I'm just curious if you read these reviews about how people are, people are loving it. Uh, to some degree. I mean, as a general rule, I just, I just avoid stuff like that only because I mean, it's which, and this goes back to sort of, you know, working in radio and all of this stuff sure. where it's like, if you, you know, it's like, if you believe the ratings when they're good, then you have to believe them when they're bad. And so yeah. I was just like, I don't even want to know. Yeah. It's like, uh, and you know, and, and reviews, I, I mean, I have looked at some of them only because like at one point, uh, my, so there was, a, uh, they'd sent advanced copies mm-hmm. out to some people, uh, you know, a couple of months before the book came out just to sort of get some advanced word started or whatever. And, and the publisher, you know, sort of sent me a sampling of like, here's like 25 reviews we got back, you know, do you want to highlight some sentences maybe we can use in advertising or something? Yep. And so, of course, I know that, you know, when you get 25 reviews sent to you and they're all good, it's like, okay, well, you're only sending me the good ones. I realize that. But um, so, yeah, so I've seen some of the response uh, from people and, you know, and people are obviously feel they're free to think whatever they want. If, you know, if they, if they like the book, great. If the book's not for them, that's also great. You know, that's everybody, you know, not, not, not everybody has to have the same taste. I will say that, um, you know, they're the people who 
people who've connected with, with the book um, seem to have really connected with it. Mm-hmm. I, it it yeah. does seem that people, it does seem like it, um, you know, it has resonated with, with some people that, you know, they've, where it really has, you know, because it is, it is a really, um, it is a really powerful story. I mean, the, just the whole saga, not just of Go Ask Alice, but of this young man, Alden Barrett, who lived and, and died and then who, who you know, uh, ended up, you know, his life sort of ended up as part of this book, Jay's Journal. And that's, yeah. you know, that's a fascinating and, and, and tragic, but really compelling story. And, um, uh, and, you know, and I am always, I mean, it, it really is beyond, it's beyond flattering that, that people have seem to respond to it, um, you know, so positively that it, it means, I mean, it means more than I could ever say that, you know, cause it's, it's a big world with a lot to do and life is short and people have a lot of choices and, you know, there's a jillion things people can do to fill their time. And so the idea that somebody would, you know, would, uh, you know, go to the library or plunk down money to get a copy of the book and read it. I mean, and much less that they would, that they would, uh, enjoy it and then that they would maybe take the time to tell other people they enjoy it i mean that means more than i could possibly say i'm just i'm massively grateful for for that well i mean it's awesome and i think that we want to make sure to tell all of our listeners that they should jump out there and get it i'm assuming like any book you could get it anywhere from the big box chains to the little guys if you can get it from the little guys if you're in oregon buy it from pals (laughs) so that's great uh, yeah it's it yeah it's available as they say wherever you buy books uh it's also available um, in electronic format, uh, you know, most bookstores now, a lot of them anyway, will sell like an uh, electronic format. For you have an audio book. It's also, um, it's also an audio book and, uh, the audio book is also available. I have no idea if that's audible or not speaking of no pun intended, <laughs> my daughter, <laughs> um, no worries. Uh, but it's also available in audio format, and uh, that is obviously from Audible, but also there are, you know, Apple Books has an audio sure. format, Google Play, and uh, Libro.fm, who partner with Powell's here in Portland for the audio format. And to preemptively answer the question, um, I do not read the audio uh, version of the book, which I understand why that makes <laughs> sense to people that I would do that. Yeah. However, um, the woman who read it, Gabra Zachman is her name, and she's a professional audiobook reader, and she did mm-hmm. a fantastic job. I mean, her it is, it's it her reading of it is excellent. She did a fantastic performance of the audiobook. So I strongly recommend that if people are into audiobooks. I like audiobook books because you know you get them while you're going, because it seems like today's day and age we're always all going and going and going. But let me ask you, as a, a writer and a reader, can I say I read a book if I only listen to it? I do. I to me that totally counts. I okay, yeah, yeah. I had this argument earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I yeah, I I you know, I yeah, I I mean, there are obviously different things, but I don't draw a distinction in terms of the experience. Like, in other words, of checking the box, being like, I have consumed that book. Yeah. You know, an audio book counts just like a regular book. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. We can say that Rick Emerson said it's, it's true. We, we exactly. did read the book. <laughs> yeah. I, yes, no, I, that, yeah, to me, they are, you know, they're both absolutely valid. You know, they, yeah, they, they're both, they're both good. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us. We really appreciate it. Um, I am so excited to get my copy. I hope everybody listening goes out and gets their copy. It's a fascinating story. You're a fascinating mind. So I, I'm excited to read it from your perspective. Uh, I think it's going to be really good. And from all the reviews I've seen, and I was digging deep, I couldn't find one negative review. And that's, you know, I had, I looked for you and they all look good. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And again, it means it means the world to me, A, that, you know, that, that uh, you're interested enough to talk about it. And thank you again for for buying a copy and and also just uh, really to, you know, to anybody, you know, uh, you know, whatever they whatever they end up thinking about it, whatever they end up, uh, you know, feeling about the book, you know, that somebody would take the time, you know, to get it and read it. That just means everything to me. So I so thank you, you know, to you and, and to everybody. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Rick. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good one. All right. All right. How about that? That was that was one heck of an interview with Rick Emerson. He is amazing. Everybody should go out and get the book. Um, you really can't go wrong. And this has been one of our better episodes in a long time. I think you guys got some bonus content. We're almost what a buck thirty, buck forty on the time. Dude, he he could have gone like even longer. Like just let him talk. Well, that, that, hour. like a, Rick Emerson is. I, I, I've been a big, huge fan of his for a long time, and he's always reminded me. And I, I meant to mention it to him. He might find this a, to be a compliment or an insult. But he reminds me of when you listen to like Quentin Tarantino get interviewed, where they're just so smart, 
that their mouths almost can't keep up with the way their brain's going. It's just so quick. It's amazing. I'm hoping that every time we see another, like, whatever he does, and if he uses this phrase, the Pop-Tart moment, that's from our show. <laughs> that's from you. You'll be famous. You're yes. the one that came up with the Rick Emerson Pop-Tart moment. So, yeah, yeah. good on you. Yeah. Uh, thank you once again, Rick, for uh, stopping by and visiting with us. Uh, I think that you've come up with a really amazing book, and everybody should go out and get it. Um, it's a real win. And so with that, we will say adieu. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll catch you on the flip side. Bye.